Hello everyone. This evening, I am going to talk about a book called The Kingdom of Auschwitz by Otto Friedrich. Now, some of you who uh, had heard my first talk on Auschwitz about six weeks ago, and that was on a book by Primo Levi called Survival in Auschwitz, also known as If I Were a Man, might remember, some of you who heard that talk might remember that I had said that I would discuss at least four books on Auschwitz. And so this evening, six weeks later, I make an attempt to redeem that promise. And I hope to be able to do at least another two books in the coming days, although there are at least a dozen books that at some point, I hope in the next few years, if I continue this series, that I would like to discuss, which have to do with the Holocaust and in particular with Auschwitz. But before I move to a discussion of today's book, I want to begin by mentioning to you all that I have long been interested in the subject of Auschwitz in particular. Of course, Auschwitz is the word by which many people actually recognize the Holocaust because it is Auschwitz of all the concentration camps which really in some ways becomes, if one may put it this way, symbolic of the Holocaust. It stands in for the Holocaust. Um, there is still a considerable body of scholarship about exactly how many people were killed in Auschwitz. But I think that there is widespread agreement that we can think of, a, think of at least a minimum of one million people and most likely one and a half million, although there were initial estimates which went as high as two and a half and sometimes even three million. But what I want to really say is this, before I venture into uh, a brief talk about the book, is that for many years I have been reading uh, with considerable attention the obituary pages of the New York Times. Uh, I think I've mentioned perhaps in one of my talks or certainly in one of my lectures at UCLA that I have long thought that the art of writing obituaries is something that is now receding from uh, the imagination of the Western world. Uh, I think that there are very few newspapers which actually now really know how to do obituaries. And among those newspapers where, at least in the English speaking world, where one can find obituary pages and sometimes find very interesting obituaries are, of course, the New York Times and, and the Guardian uh, published from England. Now, I have been collecting many of these obituaries, and when I was reading these books on Auschwitz, some in recent months, this book, uh, The Kingdom of Auschwitz, I, I finished on 9th October of this year, and I had, of course, read many other works on Auschwitz, including Primo Levi's book, which I had discussed earlier. But in reading these books, I was reminded of the fact that I had read two obituaries related to Auschwitz, which I have never forgotten. And I'd like to share those stories before I venture into a discussion of this book, because I think those stories in their own way describe what we might say is the singularity of Auschwitz. So the first obituary is of Salomo Aruch, A-R-O-U-C-H, and this is the obituary that appeared in the New York Times on 3rd May of 2009. And the obituary says, Salamo Aruch, who boxed for his life in Auschwitz, is dead at 86. He died in Israel on 26th April in 2009. He was 86 years old, of course. Um, now, who was this man and why do I mention him? Because as a young man, he had had a career as a boxer in Greece 
a very successful career in the middleweight division, where he had a 24-0 record. And then, uh, and, and he was known actually as the ballet dancer because this is some years, of course, before Muhammad Ali in the heavyweight division became very well known for dancing the ropes, as it were. Um, and I just mentioned this as a little aside, but there is a recent Tamil film um, which is really about the boxing culture of North Chennai, something I knew nothing about, and it's really a, a fascinating film. Um, I think it's called Sarpata Parambarai or something like that, uh, but it's available on Amazon Prime. It's really, uh, and one of the characters that's featured in this film is, uh, is sort of like a boxer who dances around the ring. Uh, so I was very much reminded of this film. Uh, but in any case, uh, Salamo Aruch was picked up in Thessalonica, uh, on which there is a fantastic book that I hope to discuss in the coming months, perhaps next year, by Mark Mazover. Um, he was picked up there. He was a Greek Jew in 1943 when the Nazis came into Thessalonica in Greece, um, and he was sent to Auschwitz. Now, when he arrived in Auschwitz, uh, he was... Um, uh, you know, uh, he gives a little description of what happened when he arrived in, uh, arrived in Auschwitz. He came with his mother and, and sisters. The whole family were, the whole family was shipped off to Auschwitz. And he's, he has uh, written that when they arrived in Auschwitz, his mother and sisters were immediately segregated, uh, taken apart, and he never saw them again. He never saw them again because they were immediately sent to the gas chambers. Um, and this is what he wrote. I was standing all night until the next day naked. The Nazis cleaned us with water, disinfected us, shaved our heads, and put numbers on, on our forearms, end quote. And... Salamo Aruch was assigned the number one six one excuse me one three six nine five four. A couple of days later, the prisoners are asked if there is a boxer among them. He raises his hand, he's taken aside, and he's asked to box in a ring that had been set up in Auschwitz. And he won 200 fights. He didn't lose a single fight. There were two draws. He won over 200 fights. And that's how he survived. Because if you won the match, you survived. You lived to see the next day. Right? I mean, it's a remarkable story. Apparently, there was a film made on his life called Triumph of the Spirit, which I have not seen. But this... The memory of this man's life has always remained with me after I read the obituary. And the second obituary, which is equally remarkable, is, is of a man who was not a Jew. And this is important to mention because not everyone who was sent to Auschwitz was Jewish, contrary to sort of the common view. The, the bulk of the people were Jewish, but there were many people who were sent there who were not Jewish. They included the Roma or the Gypsies, as they are more popularly known in some parts of the world. They included political prisoners, right? And I'll advert to all of that in, in 10 or 15 minutes. Um, but in any case, Joseph Pakzinski, um, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing this Polish name correctly, P-A-C-Z-Y-N-S-K-I, for those of you who would like to look up his obituary, published in the New York Times of The Guardian and The Washington Post, I read it in The New York Times. Um, and who was this man? He was a political prisoner. He was picked up, sent to Auschwitz, and he was a barber by profession. And he was the personal barber of Rudolf Hess, the camp commandant. Right? There were several other barbers, but for some reason, Rudolf Hess liked him, although Joseph Pazinski has said uh, 
had said before his death that Rudolf Hess never spoke a word to him. But he shaved this man, this, the camp commandment, hundreds of times at his home, which was just a little bit distance from the camp. Right? And he was asked this question, was he not tempted to slit Hess's throat? And he replied, I thought about it often, every day. But when I realized what the consequences would be, I simply could not do it, end quote. Right? And when he says, of course, the consequences by that, he means that he realized that if he slit Hesse's throat, hundreds of people would pay the price. Now, of course, you could argue that, well, they were sitting ducks anyhow. The vast majority of those who arrived in Auschwitz, the vast preponderant majority, did not live to see another day. The average lifespan of a person, once they arrived in Auschwitz, was about three and a half months. So if they were going to die anyhow, why didn't he slit Hesse's throat? But this is, of course, one of the many difficult questions raised by Auschwitz. This is an ethical question because, of course, if he had slit his throat, in a manner of speaking, those who would then pay the price, that those who would suffer the retribution that the Nazis would unleash in their anger, right? Their death, this barber felt, would, would be something that he would have to shoulder the responsibility for. Right? But again, as I've said, he has a full awareness of the fact that many of them went to, to their death anyhow. And needless to say, if he had slit this commandant's throat, another commandant would have come into place. It's not that the circumstances of Auschwitz would really have changed in any substantive fashion. Now, I mentioned these two stories as a long prelude to my discussion of the book because, as I had mentioned in my discussion of Primo Levi's survival in Auschwitz, one can never really fully understand what happened at Auschwitz. Auschwitz was, in fact, really a city. At one point, it had a population of 150,000. It had a soccer stadium, a boxing ring, a library, a photography lab, a symphony orchestra. And it even had underground religious services for Protestants, Catholics, and even Jews. Right? It had virtually all the services that you can think of. But what it was fundamentally, of course, was a labor camp, an extermination camp, and camp of annihilation. The annihilation of the body, the annihilation of the soul. It was a place designed to reduce man to rubble, to browbeat you into absolute, utter submission. And yet, of course, the fact is that though a vast majority of people who went to Auschwitz did not survive, some people came out of it alive and some survived, some outwitted their captors, some found a way to survive. And this is partially, of course, a testament to the human spirit, a testament to the fact that in the worst of circumstances, people will make an effort to keep themselves alive. Now, this book, The Kingdom of Auschwitz, once again, by Otto Friedrich, um, is published in 1994, but really it's published in 1980 two, because it appears as a chapter in a book called The End of the World. And Friedrich begins by invoking Dante, the gate to inferno, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. All you, all of you enter here, abandon all hope. And many of you, of course, are familiar with the fact, and I think I mentioned this in my 
in my first talk, but this is one of the things that's mentioned about Auschwitz almost everywhere, is that on the gate, at the entrance into the camp, uh, on the gate is was a sign that had been that had been um, um, you know uh, cast into the uh, uh, etched into the uh, the gate. Uh, 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 Arbeit macht frei. Work brings freedom. Right. So one of the things that we're going to find out was, of course, that Auschwitz was indeed a work camp, and Rudolf Hess, um, the camp commandant for the, the, the longest period of time. Uh, there was a short period of time when he was sent back to Germany, where he occupied a higher position. Then he comes back uh, to Auschwitz. And of course, there was a, towards the very end, Himmler himself actually really took, took charge of Auschwitz. Um, but at that point, the Nazi regime was really about to really collapse. But one of the things that uh, Friedrich uh, points to is the fact that Hess was a person who was very much committed to the work ethic, the work ethic. Um, so this, you can say that this was, of course, partly the culture of Protestantism. Um, but one of the things that's really quite striking about Auschwitz is the fact that, that you know, they had their own, the, the camp commandment, the Nazi officials, um, and many others, they had their own macabre sense of humor sometimes. Um, and one of the virtues of this book, uh, which is really very short, I mean, it's about 110 pages, but one of its virtues is that it's able to bring out some of these extraordinary features of Auschwitz. I would say that if you had to read one single short book on a camp concentration camp, um, this could very well be the book. Uh, Primo Levi's book, of course, is a classic of literature, but it doesn't give you a full-fledged kind of sociological, historical uh, account of this camp, which is what this book really seeks to do. It's, this is not a first-hand account, as is the account by uh, uh, Primo Levi. Now, as I pointed out, Auschwitz really is uh, the camp of all the camps that represents uh, the Holocaust. It's partially because of the numbers of people involved, the technology used, and also the technology used for the destruction of life. Um, um, the One of the first major historians of the Holocaust, uh, Gerard Reitlinger, um, actually had suggested that about a million, perhaps a little bit less than one million people had died. The Now the common estimate is about 1.5 million. But as I suggested earlier, there have been estimates which had placed the number of deaths at about two and to two and a half million and very rarely three million. Uh, and in fact, actually during the Nuremberg, Nuremberg uh, uh, trials for war criminals, uh, the number of two to two and a half million was mentioned frequently. Now, Auschwitz was built in a, um, in a valley about 30 miles west of Krakow, and the site was chosen by Heinrich Himmler. Um, the um, uh, Rudolf Hess, uh, so uh, Himmler was, of course, the, the head of the the uh, the uh, uh, the SS uh, the the uh, Schutzstaffel, so the secret police, and um, Rudolf Hess was in fact placed in charge of this site uh, very early. Uh, as I mentioned in passing before, he was a man who worked very hard, who believed very much in the work ethic, and um, there is a quotation uh, on page three which describes the worldview of Rudolf Hess. Quote, all my life I have thoroughly enjoyed working. And this is what Hess, Hess says just before he is sent to the gallows. So he was tried at Nuremberg as a war criminal and he was convicted. And then he continues, quote, 
I have done plenty of hard physical work under the severest conditions in the coal mines, in oil refineries, and in brickyards. I have felled timbers, cut railroad ties, and stacked peat. Work in prison is a means of training for those prisoners who are fundamentally unstable and who need to learn the meaning of endurance and perseverance. Right? Um, as a little note, I might say that so that people can better understand uh, how to locate Auschwitz in relation to the whole system of concentration camps, uh, the United States uh, Holocaust um, uh, Museum uh, has produced this huge work, which is called an encyclopedia of, of camps and ghettos, um, and it enumerates hundreds of camps and ghettos that were part of the concentration camp system. So when we are thinking about Auschwitz, you know, let us not forget that we're really speaking of a very large system here, which extended through Poland and other parts of Eastern Europe, but the vast majority of the camps, and certainly the most notorious ones, were all in Poland, right? Um, so if you move from uh, north to south, uh, east to west, we have Treblinka, we have Sobibor, uh, Belzec, Majdanek, uh, Auschwitz, Chelmo. These are among the major camps that we know of. Uh, and for reasons that I've already mentioned, Auschwitz has a kind of singularity. The first concentration camp that was set up by the Germans was in Germany itself. It was in Dachau. Dachau was actually set up not for the Jews at all. It was set up actually for political prisoners and for communists. Um, the Nazis graded these camps according to what we might describe the, from the least, uh, uh, from the most lenient to the least lenient. And Dachau was, in fact, a category one camp that is among the most lenient. Right? So uh, we can understand uh, just what Auschwitz means when we understand that even Dachau, uh, where, of course, people were killed, was still viewed as the most lenient of the camps. Uh, Auschwitz was originally designed to hold 10,000 prisoners. And uh, eventually, Hess was told that he must now, um, within literally weeks of his assuming command, that he must actually make provision for 20,000. Then he was told for 50,000 people. Um, and eventually, as I pointed out, it would become a city of 150,000, right? So um, when it was created, the idea was it would hold these prisoners who, who would actually be working as laborers uh, in munitions uh, and uh, in armaments. Um, and of course, work in munitions and the armaments industry continued in Auschwitz uh, until the very end almost, right? Um, the first train load of Polish political prisoners. So the first people who were sent there were not Jews, but Polish political prisoners. The first train load of them arrived on 14th, June, 1940. Now, since I want to keep this talk short within, within um, you know, uh, uh, 35 to 40 minutes, uh, at this juncture, I do not want to describe the train journey on which there have been a number of books written. The accounts are horrifying to the extreme because some of these train journeys to Auschwitz where prisoners were brought in by the thousands took place over a period of as much as five days. And these prisoners were herded into these cars, coaches, like cattle, and these doors were never opened. So you can now, the viewer of this video can now begin to imagine what really happened during the course of these train journeys, right? How did prisoners relieve themselves? Did they have access to water and all of that? And there is an extraordinary book uh, called The Train Journey, 
Transit, Captivity and Witnessing in the Holocaust by Simone Gigliotti, which I hope to discuss. I know that by now many of you have heard that I hope to discuss many books. Eventually I do, will get around to them, but I do hope to discuss this book, um, th although this is not among the four that I had originally selected, um, and I hope to discuss it in the months or years ahead. Now, um, I don't really wish to repeat what I had mentioned in my talk uh, in uh, talk on Primo Levi's book, uh, uh, where I had discussed uh, uh, through Primo Levi's eyes what happened in Auschwitz, the segregation of the prisoners, uh, that when they arrived, uh, some were put to the right, some were taken to the left. Uh, those who were taken to the right uh, survived initially. And those who were taken to the right were only 10% of all those who were dispatched to Auschwitz. 90% were sent straight to the gas chambers, right? And after they, these people were gassed, uh, the gold teeth were removed. The, if they were women, their hair was cut. Uh, you'd be astonished to learn, uh, among many other things, the amount of gold that was recovered in each crematorium, each crematorium every day, 18 to 20 pounds, 18 to 20 pounds of gold, right? So this was gold filling in the teeth. The prisoners were being brought in, but we have to remember that close to one and a half million people were killed. Um, and when Auschwitz was liberated, uh, the Soviets found over 15,000 pounds of hair that was waiting to be shipped off. And this hair, of course, was used for wigs and so on, right? So these are the kinds of things that one learns from this book. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of books that have been written, of course, about... about um, uh, gassing. I will come to that in a moment. But this book systematically in a page or two discusses many different elements, such as this roll call, which Primo Levi had talked about, uh, which took place nearly every day at 4.30 a.m. And sometimes the prisoners had to stand in line for as long as 20 hours, particularly when the Nazi guards and the commandant thought that there was something amiss, or if, if someone had misbehaved that others had to pay the price. There could be any number of reasons why people were detained and kept standing for 20 hours at length, right? But he also discusses, before I get to the question of gassing, he also discusses such things as the symphony orchestra, uh, the experiments undertaken in stock breeding. Many people, of course, have, have heard about the notorious experiments carried out by Dr. Dr. Mengele. Um, I'm going to not really mention that right now. Um, and Friedrich doesn't really have a detailed discussion of it in 110 pages, how much is possible anyhow. Uh, but there are obviously uh, a large number of books which are devoted to that whole question. None more interesting, I think, than Robert J. Lifton's book, The Nazi Doctors. Um, but all this is by way of saying, considering the various kinds of experiments that was conducted, the symphony orchestra, the boxing ring, the soccer stadium, uh, a brothel. There was a full-scale brothel. Uh, a, there was a black market. In fact, this black market was called Canada, uh, and it was reputedly reportedly the largest black market in Europe, and certainly one of the largest black markets in Europe, right? And this is why Hess, when he was hanged in 1947, said, quote, in Auschwitz, everything was possible. In Auschwitz, everything was possible. So, let us be very clear that Auschwitz was, in the first instance, a labor camp. And many of the people were employed to work uh, in the armaments industry, uh, in munitions, 
in the production of synthetic rubber. Um, I remember reading a book by Richard Rubinstein um, about 35 years ago, which again, a short book, a beautiful book, and I hope to turn to that at some point later on, but it's a book that really looks at slavery in the United States and the Holocaust. Um, uh, and, and he had outlined in substantial detail in that book uh, the relationship uh, of the Nazis to such large companies as IG Farben, uh, which was one of the largest um, uh, corporations in Germany, a corporation that worked in chemicals and also in such things as synthetic rubber and so on. Um, now, here's another important detail, and that brings me to the question of gassing, that when we are speaking of Auschwitz, we really have to speak about, properly speaking, Auschwitz-Birkenau, because the crematoriums were in Birkenau, which is a kind of an addition to Auschwitz. Uh, it was actually uh, built by the Russians, 10,000 10, Russians, were sent to build the crematoriums in fall of 1941 of these 10,000 in the summer of 1942. Six to eight months late, later, only 150 of them were still alive uh, at that point, right? Um, and it is in Birkenau in these crematoriums that the gassing took place. There was a question that had been posed much earlier um, when, especially after the summer of 1941, when the Nazis decided upon the so-called final solution, that, and that question that they had to, of course, probe and then find a solution to was how were the Jews and how were the other prisoners, whether they were the Roma or political prisoners or Poles, large number, of course, of Polish people, uh, Polish Jews, but also some Polish Catholics, particularly those who were political prisoners, right? How were they to be killed? What was the most efficient way of killing such a large number of people? And I think that this is where it's very important to reflect upon the fact that when people sometimes make comparisons between, let's say, the killings at Auschwitz or, to take a very different instance, the, the killings um, that were part of the partition of India in 1947, we have, to be, we have to be very clear that there is a fundamental difference between the two, okay? Uh, of course, the number of people killed in the partition we're talking about roughly one million over a short period of time. Let's say over a period of approximately three to four months, right? Uh, but these were not orchestrated by the state. There was no social engineering. In the case of the Holo Holocaust, what we are speaking about is orchestrated state killing. This was the social engineering of death on an industrial scale. When people who have done oral history have spoken to the survivors of the partition killings, and even those who were not witness to the killings but who were aware of what happened, they all, almost invariably, all of them say it was a time of madness. Somehow, friends and neighbors turned against each other, people they'd known for decades. And no one really quite understood what happened, so to speak. Right? We can, of course, talk about what the Boundary Commission did. We can talk about, about the fact that politicians sat down and negotiated certain boundaries and there were certain consequences that followed. But one cannot describe the partition killings as a state orchestrated a state orchestrated and as a form of social the social engineering of death on an industrial scale right this book along with the hundreds of other books that have been written on auschwitz alone and certainly thousands of books that have been written on the holocaust 
makes it unequivocally clear that we are speaking about a very different phenomenon here in the case of what happened in uh, not just in Nazi Germany, but under the auspices of Nazi Germany, because of course it was many of these killings were in Eastern Europe, in Poland, and elsewhere. Um, so uh, the the discussion of Zyklon B, the gas that was used, uh, this uh, this uh, book has a discussion of it. Um, uh, it was actually a gas that was really invented as a disinfectant, uh, was intended to be used partially in agriculture as well. It's manufactured actually by Degesh, D-E-G-E-S-C-H, which is a subsidiary of IG Farben. It was first tried um, on humans uh, by the deputy commander, Fritsch, uh, on six hundred Russian prisoners of war, right? Um, and 250 tuberculosis patients in the Auschwitz hospital. hospital. So this is described on page 18 uh, of this book. Um, and then, of course, there are descriptions of how, you know, the victims were taken to these, to, uh, you know, uh, to uh, the rooms where showers had been installed, uh, they had to first strip themselves and they were locked into this and then they thought they were taking a shower and then of course gas would would be would be piped into this room which was shut and within minutes they would all die. Um, but it is not really necessary for me to enter into I think further details uh, about this. Uh, what I think the book is really remarkable about, remarkable in its own way, because in 100 pages, he's 100, 110 pages, he's really able to condense not just quite a lot of information, but to be able to actually articulate a certain uh, point of view. That point of view is really expressed best uh, towards the end when he cites um, William Styron and uh, Eli Wiesel, uh, William Styron, the novelist, uh, who said at Auschwitz, tell me, where was God? And the question, the answer to that question was, but where was man? Or take, for example, the verdict of Eli Wiesel, who said, quote, there is no one person who could tell the whole truth about Auschwitz. And Eli Wiesel, who survived it, and of course who becomes a very well-known novelist and eventually wins the Nobel Prize for Literature, says that he was never really able to fully understand Auschwitz. So what Friedrich is setting out to do in this book is to, is to actually give you an overview of Auschwitz, discuss various aspects of it, some of them very puzzling, right? Why did they have a hospital? Why were they so serious about treating people and half an hour after they were treated for an illness, they were sent to the gas chambers? What's the logic there, you think to yourself, right? That's the question that really animates Friedrich. He says, for example, on pages 23 to 24, that the doctors were meticulous in examining the patient. And then, as I've said, once they had conducted the examination, prescribed medicines, then they would send the person to the gas chamber. Was this simply a kind of German meticulousness? Was this a way of saying to them that, look, as a doctor, this is my duty. I do this. Now the camp commandant has his duty. His duty is to send them to the gas chambers. Right? But there were obviously people who were saved in the hospital as well. Right? So we cannot say that Auschwitz was, yes, it was a machinery for death, but we cannot say that the sole purpose of Auschwitz was simply to send people to death. Why else did they have a hospital which actually saved many people? Primo Levi himself was sent to, <coughs> excuse me, the hospital at Auschwitz, 
on more than one occasion. And he survived. He survived to tell the tale. I haven't mentioned, of course, that Primo Levi subsequently committed suicide. Years after the liberation of Auschwitz, perhaps it was difficult for him to live with the burden of what he had seen. Perhaps it is difficult being a witness. Right? But Friedrich is also trying to suggest that the SS men, the guards, were not sadists. They were, unfortunately, unfortunately, ominously, perfectly normal men. The perfectly normal men and women sometimes can be driven to do the most evil things. But the puzzle continues. They were prisoners who stole bread because the rations that were given were clearly inadequate. So therefore you were always tempted to steal. But then when you stole and you were caught, then you were sentenced to death. But there's a kind of a macabre sense of, as I said, humor almost about it. You're sentenced to death in a place where you're destined to die, barring a few who are going to come out alive one way or the other, right? These are all the kinds of anomalies and puzzles that this book does not explore at length because that's not really the mandate that the author has set for himself but it alerts the reader to them. And that's why I think this book is really worthwhile reading. Um, and for those of you who are viewers in India, even elsewhere, really, frankly, uh, there are little tidbits here and there. I'll mention only one of them, which, is, which really came as a surprise to me, um, although I think that there was a very brief mention of it without a description uh, in Primo Levi, and, and I've seen that perhaps in one or two other books on Auschwitz. But one of the things that Friedrich says, Otto Friedrich says, uh, this is on page 40, and I'll quote here, and you'll see why I refer to readers or viewers in India, especially the Auschwitz prisoners, I'm quoting, easily recognize these marks of coming death, right? That the, that the person who knew that, that the prisoners there knew that they were really at the verge of death because they were listless, uh, they're, they're, they had a faraway look in their eyes, their pupils were unnaturally enlarged. Um, their life was slowly being stolen from them, right? They were, many of them were emaciated. So the Auschwitz prisoners, I quote, easily recognize these marks of coming death and with the stinging acerbity of the death camps, they likened the numbed victims to the starving beggars of India and named them Musulmaner or Muslims, right? And of course, we know that one of the words that was used for Muslims were Muslims. In fact, colloquially, that is actually the most common word that, that um, has been used, at least in the Hindi-speaking belt um, in North India, to describe the Muslims, right? But let me conclude this um, discussion. Uh, I have several other things that I would have liked to mention, but I think that I've gone on long enough. But let me conclude here uh, with a story uh, that Otto Friedrich dis tells us. Extraordinary story. And this is one of the reasons why I think Auschwitz remains a real puzzle. It remains a philosophical, ethical problem and issue um, to think about. And this story concerns, um, the, the story appears on page 48. Uh, he describes it by beginning the paragraph as a whimsical turn of fate, right? So the story concerns an Austrian, Austrian leftist by the name of Rudolf Freimel, uh, who was arrested, 
He was a leftist, a communist, and eventually he was shipped to Auschwitz when he's caught. And But before he's sent to Auschwitz in France, he had become involved with a French woman who had borne him a son. And he had promised to marry her, and she demanded that he marry her. Now, her demand comes to the attention, but before the marriage could take place, he's shipped off to Auschwitz, right, because he's captured, right? She is not Jewish. Um, uh, so her demand reaches the attention of the Nazi authorities, and apparently this matter was brought to the attention of Himmler, Friedrich says, perhaps to Hitler himself. It's not quite clear. But let me read the rest of what he says. From the highest levels, the orders came down, decreeing that Mademoiselle Ray, this is the woman he had agreed to marry, and her son should be taken to the labor camp at Auschwitz so that she could be married and her son legitimized. So the Nazis really so bourgeois that they said, well, we must really honor this pledge of marriage that this Jewish person has given to this French woman, right? What is really going on there? Why, why do they succumb to this demand? Let me continue. Such sponsorship inspired the Auschwitz authorities to the most elaborate preparations. Fremel, Fremel, sorry, that's the name of the Jewish prisoner, right? Rudolf Fremel, was stripped of his prison rags and outfitted with a new suit that had been specially ironed by the capo, right? So the capo was the, the, the people who uh, ran the show on behalf of the SS. So these were the, the feared, hated, ferocious guards, right? Uh, the middlemen, if we meant, might call them that, right? So his suit had been specially ironed by the capo in the laundry room. He was even issued a necktie and matching socks. Somewhere a priest was found to marry the Austrian and his bride. Then they had their matrimonial picture taken by a technician from the Auschwitz photo lab. She with a bouquet of flowers in her arms. A group of musicians from the Auschwitz orchestra played appropriate tunes. The newlyweds then went to the camp brothel which had been emptied of its regular inhabitants in honor of the wedding night. The next day, the French woman and her son were shipped back to France, and the Austrian was put back into his prison uniform and returned to his work gang. End quote. Pages 48 to 49. Right? This was Auschwitz. Thank you.